Okay. Hey, let me just say one thing, Ori. This is so exciting to have your mom right next to you. Like it just makes this even more of a family and community event. So it's a it's a special one. And please keep her in the shot. I want, I want to. Make, it's awesome. It's giving me a lot of uh, inspiration and motivation. I uh, I just dropped my daughter off at school and she she was in her pajamas when we left after breakfast and she said, "Oh, I got to get ready in case they'll in case they'll see me. <laughs> so they're, they're all ready for you guys." Um, okay. So, uh, this is a 47 year old guy. Um, and maybe what I'll, what I'll let you know is how I, uh, how I met him and I met him as a holdover, um, in the ICU. Um, and he had already been stabilized. Um, so let me tell you how he came in. He came into the ED, um, in the evening, he had had, um, a couple hours of fever and nausea. Um, and over the last several days had had joint pain and, and, and these fevers. Um, the joint pains were in, his, in both of his hands, um, in his right knee and left elbow. Um, he had had one episode of loose stool and just a little bit of dysuria, but he kind of was like, I maybe it was kind of a soft call. And he came to the ED uh, because he couldn't control the fevers with, um, with Tylenol. Robbie, do you want uh, do you want to go first? Yeah, no, I'll just I'll jump in and pass the mic to you. I think um, you know the um, the data that we have right now is such an intriguing overlap. We know that this patient eventually gets critically ill and goes to the ICU, and I think that that's a data point to study uh, because it's relatively unusual for people with joint pain and fevers um, uh, to go to the ICU, and the reason that is um, is if we start with the world of joint pain assuming that only one joint is affected, usually the disease is actually outside the joint. The most common, um, uh, the most common causes of knee pain are, are prepatellar bursitis. The most common cause of elbow pain is also bursitis. The most common cause of shoulder pain is, uh, is rotator cuff disease. What, what changes from that very benign landscape in terms of morbidity when multiple joints are involved is the probability of a periarticular disease goes down and the probability of an intra-articular disease process goes up. And so when you hear multiple joints are involved, you're immediately thinking, oh, okay, I bet it's actually in the joint. And that's when the focus at least initially is on infectious diseases within the joint with some credit um, to the possibility of uh, crystalline diseases, but more likely autoimmune diseases. And um, the, the, the focus, as we alluded to for the first few hours, is to say, okay, this patient has multiple joints. I'm worried about an infection, i.e. septic arthritis. And um, if you apply a rapid filter to, okay, what causes uh, uh, polyarticular septic arthritis uh, and makes somebody ill, the immediate reflex is to think about endocarditis um, and its associated complications elsewhere resulting in critical illness with a small bit of time reflected to the possibility of disseminated gonococcal infection, though that really results in a critical illness. So the rapid fire thinking here, when you're pre-ICU is usually when a patient says one joint hurts, it's actually not the joint, it's periarticular disease. When they start to report multiple joints involved, it begins, the journey starts to move in the joint itself with infection, crystal and autoimmune being the three tiers of causes, but infection in all caps because of its morbidity. And there are many causes of infectious septic arthritis, but your first analysis should be, hey, could this be endocarditis because of how many joints I'm seeing uh, involved? And so that's where my mind would be going. Um, I'll pass the mic to Reza to see if any additional thoughts are there and know that when we hear about how this patient got critically ill, that'll be very informative too. Yeah, I, I really love that approach. And, and the truth is you can take the same approach to someone with fever and, and monoarticular arthritis. That is really what you're trying to answer. Is there an infection or is there crystalline disease? So once you layer inflammation and joint pain, all of a sudden these two become prioritized. But I think I want to just make a, a very important teaching point. You saw Ori share a, a couple of problems with us. There was dysuria. There was diarrhea or one loose stool. There was nausea. And then you saw Robbie focus primarily on the joint. 
the truth is here, it seems like the joint is taking center stage. And so appropriately, we put our cognitive effort there. But if you step back and say someone has inflammation, the next step is discovering where the inflammation is originating from. And then you prioritize that sort of I made demonic of infection, cancer, and autoimmune processes. The dysuria was mild, so Robbie ignored that. Um, the one loose bowel movement might be relevant, but not enough to really draw our attention. And the truth is joint pain itself can just be a bystander as opposed to a signal. The reason we're focused on it now is because we're trying to explain the finding, but it's not uncommon to have fevers and have some diarrhea, have some nausea, have some joint pain. So I think what's gonna be critical is examining the joints to see if they're hot and inflamed, then that would add additional support to allow us to make progress in terms of the DDX. But I'm looking forward to, to hearing more from Maureen. Great. Um, okay, so let me tell you a little bit about his past medical history and which will actually uh, blend into the HPI. So um, for his past medical history, so he has CKD, um, stage three, um, that fr is from like a chronic interstitial nephritis from N that was thought to be from NSAIDs and uh, methamphetamine use that had been biopsied. Um, he's had gout since he was 18 years old. Um, he'd never, or he's had like quote unquote gout. He'd never had um, a tap with a pr crystal proven gout. Um, and he's on only 50 milligrams of allopurinol every day. And then he has psoriasis um, and he's on a IL-23 inhibitor called guselcumab, and he had failed multiple other monoclonals and, and as well as Humira. Um, and over the past six months, he's had worsening dysphagia um, that was thought to be from TOFI on his, on, like within his um, larynx and, and esophagus impairing his swallowing. Um, and then interestingly over, so this, I saw him in December um, and since October, um, he had had two prior um, ICU admissions for essentially fulminant shock. So um, in October, he got admitted to UCSF um, and he came in, he uh, was very, very sick um, and went to the ICU. He required pressors um, and they thought that it was from essentially a, a dental abscess, uh, which got drained um, and had two teeth pulled. Um, and then he had antibiotics and was sent home. In November, he had another presentation with shock uh, where they didn't find any infectious etiology, but again, it was this distributive shock that required pressors and that self-resolved. Um, and then he was again presenting today. Um, his meds, so he's on, he takes this guselcumab, which is this, uh, the monoclonal. He, for um, his psoriasis, he also does whole body uh, baths of triamcinolone twice a day. So he, he covers his whole body. He takes the allopurinol and then he takes a mix of pain medications, but no NSAIDs. Um, his family history uh, was non-contributory. His social history, uh, as I mentioned, of past methamphetamine use, he lives with his three kids um, and he is actually now wheelchair bound um, from the gouty arthritis. Um, he denied alcohol, any illicit drug use. He, he's a never smoker. Um, he has no allergies. And maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll go through the vitals and the exam, and then, and then I'll, I'll give you just that little bit of extra data. So um, when the resident sees him um, down in the recess bay, his, his vital signs are, so he's afebrile, his heart rate's in the 130s, um, and his blood pressure's in the 80s over 50s. Um, he's on room air. Um, he's put on pressors and, with a, and given fluids. Um, he's in moderate distress, mostly from joint pains. Um, his HENT exam is unremarkable. His cardiovascular exam is notable just for tachycardia, regular tachycardia. Um, his lungs are clear. His abdomen is soft, non-tender, and non-distended. Um, his neuro exam is non-focal. Um, and then I want to, if I can, it, I don't know if it's possible for me to share my screen. I'll share a picture of what his skin looked like and the joints. Let's see. 
I just made you co-host, so you should be able to share your screen already. Okay. You're, you're taking this VMR to another level, man. This <laughs> is like so the, much info coming, and we're going to see pictures. Oh my gosh. This is the craziest <laughs> case I've ever seen. So his, so his, this is what his skin. This is these are his feet. These are the only uh, de-identified picture that I had. Um, but this is the way his skin looked over his whole body. So it was red and inflamed and really warm everywhere. Um, and then it was just kind of like diffusely swollen and doughy. Um, and it, his joint exams were pretty much all like that. He had slightly, his his um, right knee and, sorry, his, le his right knee and left elbow were slightly more tender than others, but it was it, he was pretty diffusely tender and uncomfortable. Boy, oh my gosh, <laughs> I don't even know where to start. <laughs> but maybe I think for this one, Robbie, rather than me assigning you a specific um, you know, topic to discuss, I'm just going to share some of my thoughts and then you just pick up and, and go wherever you want. Because we, we, we got so many, so many uh, data points here. And the question becomes, how do we frame this patient? And how do we use the past medical history to influence our understanding of the foreground problem. And what is the foreground problem? Problems, not problem. And maybe I'll start with the last picture you showed, um, showing the redness in the feet that you said Ori was sort of full body redness, correct? So folks, the same way when you see jaundice, you convert that to hyperbilirubinemia, and then you share an approach to hyperbilirubinemia, when you see full body redness, your mind should convert that to erythroderma. So the, really the problem that my mind is trying to solve is twofold. One, what is causing this erythrodermic picture? And is erythroderma enough to explain the rest of the patient's finding? The most concerning being hypotension or shock. The second problem we're trying to solve here this is not a monophasic illness. It's not like this patient is presenting for the first time with hypotension. This is a recurrent clinical syndrome. That's very important. It's not even a biphasic illness like Whipple's disease. This is something that flares and then subsides. It flares and then it subsides. And whenever you're in that category of illnesses, a few come to mind. For example, exposures. Could this patient be exposed to something that causes a flare of this clinical syndrome? Let me give you an example. If you're exposed to a specific drug, so we know that this patient's on a monoclonal antibody, is on allopurinol, has CKD. So this patient is at risk of drug exposure, and then flare. So how can we put this story together? They get the drug, they have a reaction to the drug, then they develop erythroderma. And if you have erythroderma, you're literally having, like it's extreme vasodilation. So all your blood is being shunted to the skin. Guess what that does to cardiac um, return? You actually might be in a high output cardiac failure and you can decrease venous return cardiac output and your blood pressure and have hypotension. So even if you frame this from just erythroderma itself, you can explain all of this patient's findings. And when you go down the thought of erythroderma, 30% of the time it's idiopathic, but the, the most common known etiology of erythroderma is a primary inflammatory skin disease like psoriasis. Psoriasis is one of the most common causes of um, erythroderma. But what makes that unlikely, again, of psoriasis being the cause of this patient's erythroderma, it could be, and maybe we're dealing with something else that ex is explaining the recurrent flares, is the recurrent, that qualifier, recurrent flares, just in my mind means either exposure or some kind of autoimmune phenomenon. What it lessens the likelihood of is something like infection, which typically is monophasic, or, or cancer, which is typically doesn't have this flare. So all of a sudden for me, some kind of hypersensitivity reaction becomes most likely. Now, what would be really important to know is, was this patient exposed to something 
preceding each of these flares. So did they get a drug and then within you know, an hour or two, they have an IgE mediated hypersensitivity reaction causing the cutaneous manifestations, causing the hypotension, um, possibly. So Ori hasn't shared that with us. And many times at time point zero, when you're admitting the patient, you actually don't have um, that, that information. And you have to go back and look at the chart and get a history. And so um, where I am, and I'm gonna pass the mic to Robbie because I can keep discussing this case, is that um, this is a patient vulnerable to drug toxicity because of the CKD. This patient seems to be having some kind of recurrent illness that's marked with erythroderma hypotension. And I think the hypotension tachycardia can all be explained by um, the skin manifestation, but the fever makes you wonder if there is cytokine release and some kind of cytokine storm causing all of the patient's picture. But then the question is, why is that happening? Oh, I, I love that. You know, I think I think what Reza is showing us is the power of meticulous clinical reasoning and going through these things thoughtfully and systematically. And you know, the the only thing um, uh, that I can offer is uh, is um, as Reza kind of initially suggested is just a, a different lens on this issue. And the different lens isn't is just to be earnest about what I would be thinking if this were happening right now where I'm sitting um, in the emergency room. And so here would be my reflex thought. Uh, this patient is very ill and they're definitely in distributive shock because uh, of their skin findings showing a, um, a low SVR. They cannot be in any other form of shock because of their skin findings. So I'm immediately worried about septic shock and the one notorious infection that looks like this with diffuse erythroderma and causes septic shock is um, toxic shock syndrome. That is a culture negative uh, usually, especially when it's staph aureus. So immediately my, my move right after that is to put this patient on toxic shock therapy potentially and hydrate them. And then, um, uh, and then I would look at the medications and there's so many hits for adrenal insufficiency. There's the fact that this patient is taking so much steroids um, that they could have easily tertiary adrenal insufficiency on the steroids and then they could have immunotherapy or medication related adrenal insufficiency from um, uh, this medication that they have, though I'm not sure if that would be the medication. And then uh, uh, opiate pain medications, if he's on pain medications, also cause a central adrenal insufficiency. So he has two risk factors for central adrenal insufficiency, the amount of steroids that he's taking and the potential opiates. And um, the other risk factor that he has is this potentially this uh, medication. So then I would immediately think about giving this patient steroids and probably would do so at least one time dose. So just from the ER perspective, this patient is getting bank, uh, ertapenem, clindamycin, <laughs> And, and steroids. I'm going crazy here, y'all. Uh, but he's sick. He's really, really sick. And then I would take a moment, not more than a moment, to think, hey, what else could do this um, that isn't, isn't a psoriasis or toxic shock? And I would think briefly about the possibility that this is a, T -cell, a very aggressive T-cell lymphoma. Um, I think I've been fooled by it before with Cesare syndrome being the one lymphoma that mimics psoriasis like this. But I would put that... I would put that thought um, locked uh, and not to distract from the, how critically ill this patient is. And I, th I think that um, Reza's reflex of this being drug induced cannot be ignored. So making sure that this problem isn't reflective of a visceral problem with skin manifestation. So keen attention to the possibility of hepatitis, nephritis, which would reframe this case dramatically as not a super sick patient with erythroderma, but a super sick patient with every organ down and erythroderma, which would bring the drugs back into close scrutiny. But I think you have to be practical. DCing a drug only has effects hours, days later. I, don't, I think I'd be very generous with antibiotics and very generous with steroids, um, as is the uh, stereotype in the ER. So I'd probably be reinforcing that in this case. All right, Ori, back to you. Great. Okay, so uh, so he got hydrocort, vancurta, and clindamycin, um, and a stat derm consult that I have like I, to be honest, I've never seen derm so excited. So they they came into the ED, and then they looked at the pictures of him from a prior visit, and they were actually like, oh, this actually looks much improved from his prior visit. So they felt that his skin was actually not so concerning. Um, and they said to uh, consider other infectious causes of distributive shock. So let me let me give you a little bit of data, um, and then and then 
and then I'll, yeah, let me give you, I'm going to give you a big aliquot of data here. Okay. So, um, for his labs, uh, so his white count was 34. Um, his hemoglobin was at his baseline of 8.6 and his platelets were 628. Um, his BMP, uh, was markedly abnormal. So his, uh, sodium was 134. His K was 5.3. His chloride was 106, his bicarb was 14, his BUN was 59, uh, and his creatinine was 4.45. Um, his baseline creatinine was 3.2. He had a glucose in the 40s um, and uh, got, a, got a bunch of D50 uh, amps. Um, and then his LFTs, um, so he initially had um, a T Billy elevation at 1.6 and an Alphas elevation at 347 with normal transaminases. Um, and it was uh, predominantly indirect bilirubin. Um, his troponin uh, was 0.15 to 0.19, both like which are elevated on our assay at UCSF. Um, and then his VBG was 7.29. Uh, with a PCO2 of 33, um, and his lactate was 3.4 and then went to 4.4 as he was getting more fluids. Um, he had a UA with uh, esterase, with Luke esterase and greater than 50 whites. Um, he had a chest x-ray with bivasilar streaky opacities. Um, and then I'll give you the CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, which was done in the ED, and then we can kind of talk more, I think. So, so the CT chest showed diffuse bilateral axillary lymphadenopathy, which they called likely reactive, um, no focal consolidations in the lungs, and then bivasilar atelectasis, as well as bilateral degenerative changes um, in the glenohumeral joints with joint effusions. The CT abdomen pelvis showed a, a stable enhancement of the gallbladder wall with edema and um, enhancement of the common hepatic and common bile ducts, um, as well as adenopathy uh, of the bilateral inguinal nodes. And they actually commented that all of the ab abdomen findings were stable or improved from his last CT abdomen pelvis, which had happened like essentially in the ED during the last fulminant shock presentation. And then he had a bunch of cultures, which I will uh, hold off, which were no growth to date as of right now. Prof Rez, I don't know what to do here. This is so, uh, this is such a unique, um, this is definitely a unique case. And there's no doubt about that. I think everyone who's on this call can appreciate that. And I think the presentation here is even more unique and very, very, very uh, powerful storytelling. Um, I think it's very hard to take this data and to synthesize it in clear linear thinking. And um, maybe I can uh, reflect on the labs and pass the mic to Prof. Rez to reflect on the imaging. And I think the key thing with the labs is to understand the nature of that leukocytosis. And I'll ask, um, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll ask Ori if you can tell us if it's neutrophil predominant because um, the diff here would change the uh, calculus tremendously. And I'm getting a thumbs up, so we'll. Oh, no, go ahead, Ori, please. It, it was all neutrophils and a lot of um, bands. Yeah. yeah, a lot of bands. So um, the neutrophilia and bandemia is very informative here. And neutrophils don't always equal infection, but the presence of bands has that has that very concerning, uh, uh, very concerning possibility. And so, um, you know, the, the key question is, is, does the height of the white count inform the analysis? The answer is, yeah, plus minus. Um, I think that when somebody has such a profound leukocytosis, we have been taught to think about the possibility of clostridial infections and candida are the two big ones. But the truth is any infection severe can mount a white count this high. It's not too surprising that his kidney dysfunction is worse now in the face of this critical illness. Um, what is int intriguing is reflecting on his glucose. And the... Um, in this instance, we actually don't necessarily meet Whipple's triad, right? This piece, Whipple's triad is designed for us to make sure that we're not picking up a laboratory error. And uh, here in this case, the fact that the glucose is low makes me wonder about the possibility of adrenal insufficiency, but also the possibility that he may have some access to insulin, which we don't know about, but then finally a possibility of cancer. 
and cancer causing this is called, called the Warburg effect, which it's hard not to think about with the imaging findings. But those would be my initial thoughts. I think the infection hypothesis is reinformed and then a cancer enters the fray in the hypoglycemia without insulin as is AI. I'll pass the mic to Reza to reflect on the imaging. Brilliant, Robbie. Um, Ori, can I ask you a question? Did you have an LDH on this patient? Uh, no, but I will check in one second. Oh, no, no worries. If you don't have it, then it's then I'm not going to incorporate it into my thinking. That was <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, that's okay. It was normal. Normal. Got it. Um, I, I'll be honest with you guys. What, what I'm really struggling with is knowing what to include in in the frame of the current presentation. Uh, to give you an example, the erythroderma that was most concerning to me during the physical exam was, we were later told it actually was improved compared to the prior presentation. And here ordinarily lymphadenopathy would be front and center of your problem representation. But once again, Ori told us that the lymphadenopathy is also improved compared to the prior presentation. So what do we do with all that? I think you do two things. One is you ask the question, is the diagnosis of erythroderma from psoriasis correct? And what is causing the lymphadenopathy? That's more of like the chronic and background problem that my mind is trying to solve. In the foreground, um, with the hypotension and knowing that patients that have skin disease are at risk of breach with normal skin flora, a bacterial infection uh, ends up being prioritized. So almost like two problems, maybe not um, completely part of the same illness, but maybe one problem made the patient vulnerable to another problem. For example, strep or staph bacteremia can present like this, but we still haven't you know, answered what's happening in the background. And all of this is confounded by the medications that the patient is receiving. In general, um, you know, with the acute problem, I have nothing to add to what Robbie said, and we'll see what the culture data shows, but we know patients with cutaneous disease are at risk of bacteremia um, from their skin flora. With regard to the background, I think you have to sort of ask the question, do you expect diffuse lymphadenopathy with psoriasis? In most patients with erythroderma of all cause, um, you might, in, in a fraction of them, you might have a lymphadenopathy, but then you have to ask the question, which diseases are most likely to cause erythroderma and lymphadenopathy? And the thing that immediately jumps to mind is a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Uh, the good thing with that is that you can evaluate the peripheral blood smear to see if you have cesare cells. Uh, the thing with cesare cells, it's not enough to identify them in the peripheral blood smear. They actually have to be greater than 20% for you to be concerned for a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Other causes of diffuse lymphadenopathy, common culprits include lupus, which I think is less likely in this uh, situation and with this robust uh, presentation. Then um, other autoimmune diseases, sarcoid, but you wouldn't have this cutaneous uh, manifestation. Then viral syndromes, you have to worry about HIV, uh, infectious mononucleosis. Those are um, you know, common causes and, and all patients with diffuse lymphadenopathy should have those uh, conditions evaluated for. And then finally, drug-induced uh, lymphadenopathy and rash. So to summarize, I feel like my mind is solving two problems, a chronic one, which is lymphadenopathy and rash, which makes me concerned for a cutaneous lymphoma, but then a more robust and acute problem, which is hypotension and um, almost a leukomoid reaction where you have a very high white blood cell with those bands, which makes me most concerned for strep or staph given the cutaneous finding. So I'm very interested to see how Ori was, you know, synthesizing all this data, but very challenging case so far based on the number of frames that we're trying to simultaneously solve. Yeah, that's awesome. So I think, so this is where I got him the next morning. Um, and I was like, oh man, this is, this is like gonna be an incredible case and he's gonna be so sick. And I walk into the ICU room and he's off pressers. His blood pressure is like in the 120s over 80s. Um, he's just mildly diacardic in the like low hundreds um, and he's chilling and he's totally fine. 
Um, so let me give you another bunch of data. Um, and then I think that we're that I think this will be the last aliquot of data. And then I'll be very happy to hear what you guys think. And I have an idea for what's going on, but I don't have a final, a true final answer. Okay. So his HIV and EBV were negative. Um, he and his uh, hepatitis serologies were, were negative. He had, so one blood culture grew staph epi. Um, and then he had 10,000 mixed staph in his urine culture. Um, and he, so based on the blood cultures, and he had had one blood culture that had had staph epi in his October hospitalization. Um, we got a TTE to look for any valve, any valve vegetations. Um, and his TTE actually was just notable for very thickened mitral leaflets. Um, so they didn't see a veg, but it's not the best test. So we actually got a TEE, which showed again, the thickening of the mitral leaflets and what they actually thought were tophi on the leaflets without vegetations. So it was just like essentially truly bad gout. Um, we recultured him a couple times, nothing grew. Um, we set a bunch, send a bunch of fungal serologies, nothing grew. Um, but just to reinforce the clinical kind of trajectory, he got better within 12 hours of getting the hydrocort and the, these antibiotics. Um, he uh, ortho tapped both his knee and his elbow, and they were both actually um, just showed um, the like essentially um, where the knee was actually dry and the elbow um, just had like a few whites and um, and crystals. So uh, we had a key consult and then we did one intervention and then that was that that'll be the end of the case. Uh, th this is incredibly helpful and it reminds me of the time where I, I was taking care of a patient in Baltimore and this patient would come to the hospital sick, fever, hypoxemia, CT would show multiple opacifications in the lung. The patient would be started on vancomycin and cefepime, and then within 12 hours, he would be on room air, afebrile, and speaking comfortably. So the first time he came, uh, we treated him as a community-acquired pneumonia, discharged him. The second time he came, again, we treated him as a community-acquired pneumonia and discharged him. The third time he came, we we're like, wait, this makes zero sense. Like, why is this patient getting better within 12 hours? That's just not part of the illness script for community-acquired pneumonia. And what we learned was that the patient was actually feeding pigeons that had just like started you know, sitting on his uh, window. And so this patient actually had hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So after the third hospitalization, we actually discharged them to an Airbnb, uh, you know, sort of a housing that was in his house. And he did well, he didn't come back to the hospital. And in fact, one of the interns saw him at a bar several days later doing well. So I think this rapid improvement, and Ori, you highlighted this, is key to understanding what's happening here. It really does, and, and also just the recurrent flares, um, it just makes infection less likely as a primary etiology, though it's always difficult to um, stop antibiotics and not treat, uh, just to, given how sick this patient was. Um, and then you went one step further to get that TE and show it consistent with COVID. This is a very rare mimic of endocarditis. And it just like blows my mind. We had a case of calcification in someone with end-stage renal disease that embolized to the brain, which was another rare mimic. And then you tap the joint and that too was negative. So the question is what's going on here? And I will tell you, um, you know, Robbie mentioned adrenal insufficiency and many times with adrenal insufficiency, you might have like a mild eosinophilia, which is a clue. Like if you're hypotensive with a mild eosinophilia, this becomes a very prominent clue. But I, I just can't tie in everything with adrenal insufficiency. I would love to hear what Robbie thinks because what's happening in the joints, what's happening in the skin, what's happening in the lymph nodes, I still think there's a problem there that has yet to be diagnosed and not a problem that gets immediately better in 12 hours. Um, so I would be really interested to know how the teams were thinking about this sort of um, syndrome of erythroderma, lymphadenopathy, and now 
what seems to be um, non-infectious, non-crystalline polyarthritis. So there's a syndrome there that I don't think gets explained with just the, the 12 hours of the blood pressure being better, which could be consistent with an endocrinopathy because these patients do respond quickly. But I will pass the, the mic to um, RG to layer on that thought because I, I really don't know what's going on. You know, um, I will prove that I also don't know what's going on by speculating and by sharing with you what I'm thinking, which is that I'm wondering if he's one big joint. And what I mean by that is um, in most patients, we assume that their gout deposits in their joint and an absolutely crazy neutrophilic leukocytosis up to 200,000 I've seen in the joint occurs from a vigorous, aggressive reaction to gouty crystals resulting in acute debilitating pain. Just two days ago, um, we had a patient here in the emergency room um, and uh, who presented uh, with abrupt, basically two hours of the most crazy swelling in his knee. And um, uh, one of the incredible interns who's actually here in the emergency room today, uh, Alice, tapped the knee and we got 80 cc's out. And presumably this amount of fluid developed over the course of hours. Um, and the neutrophil count on it was 40, 50 times the upper limit of normal. Um, and with the, the degree of extra articular tophi that you're describing, compressing his esophagus as we see it on his joints and his skin, and we see it, um, most tellingly, we see it inside his blood vessels and on his heart. Um, and I um, had some reinforcement of a rare pearl that I was taught in residency about gout endocarditis um, as part of the practice that Reza and I got with the calcinosis case, read about gout endocarditis. And I'm purely speculating. I'm glad he's much better. And I just wonder if his body is one big joint and that he's having an aggressive inflammatory reaction in his endovascular system in the same way that people should only be limited to in their joints. Um, I, I don't know if that's a phenomenon that's described. It's a power of analogical reasoning to, to speculate on these things, which are dangerous in the moment because you don't want to anchor on them. But it's, it's predicated on the observations that Rez outlined, which is that this is a in inflammatory syndrome of which there's no question that's correct. This is an inflammatory syndrome that responds in 12 hours to one of three things, time, antibiotics, or steroids. And I think Reza and I would be hard pressed to find a case of such dramatic improvement from near death from time alone. From antibiotics happens, but pretty quickly, so labeling this as steroid responsive begets that hypothesis of, is there something that is triggering the immune system in a way um, that is beyond adrenal insufficiency? And the triggers here could be medications triggering an anaphylactoid type reaction or crystals that are triggering another non-infectious inflammatory syndrome. So what would I be doing in real life? I'd probably be talking to some pretty smart people as Ori was alluding to. And I would be trying to look up if this is actually a phenomenon that's described. I've never heard of it before. Um, but because it, gain, it has credence in a syndrome limited to a small body part, I'd be curious if it's been described. But the, if I'm speculating that this whole person is essentially behaving in a way that their joint is, then it tells you that I'm way off in a, in a lonely desert, in a lonely diagnostic desert. So I will lean heavily on Ori to uh, bring us back to the real world. R Ravi, I, I love that analogical reasoning. W were there crystals in the joint? Is that right, Ori? Or, oh, I, I thought that it was totally bland. Okay, that, that's helpful to know. Um, okay, so we so first of all, the uric acid level was 12, which is high. Um, it had been high in all of his prior hospitalizations. Um, and so essentially, we got to this point where we were like, what is this? What are we doing with this guy? And so we, I called room. He's also felt that he needed to get his allopurinol increased and he had missed follow-up because of his being wheelchair bound. And I told the story to the room fellow and the room fellow said, oh, there's a single case report essentially of a gout flare leading to like massive distributive shock. 
And in these patients, the key is essentially to prophylax them, give them more allopurinol, and then to give anakinra during the, like, during the shock. And they are also um, steroid responsive. And so generally that was our presumed diagnosis. And what we discharge him as was essentially a gout flare leading to essentially um, a non-infectious distributive shock and essentially and SERS response. Um, and uh, I mean, that, that was phenomenal, Robbie. I, I actually wrote to my mom here. I said, they're not close after the, the next to last aliquot. And then, and then you really brought it home there at the end. That was awesome. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been two months now and he hasn't, he hasn't come back to the hospital. So, um, he's on like 150 milligrams of allopurinol a day. Um, and, uh, and he's following up now with Durham and with, uh, with room. So that that's him. Uh, Ori, that was phenomenal. Um, very, very interesting case. I, I think that um, it seems like it'd be very likely, but whenever you have just one case report of a, of a disease, that's one case, and you can find a case report for everything, um, it's still very plausible, uh, you know, a hypothesis, but I think you still have to rule out, you know, potentially life-threatening uh, processes. Uh, so I think, I, I, I think that the, the story would be, but I would just be very cautious, you know? I, I totally agree. And in fact, we then like the, the next room fellow, it would, I like caught a weekend room fellow. And then on Monday morning, the weekday room fellow came on and was like, oh, this is definitely not a thing. And then, <laughs> and then they staffed with the attending and the attending was like, oh, we're like, this is total, we're totally down for this. Like this actually fits completely. Um, so we had a room buy-in um, and, and he got better. And I think that, I think the question is like, what would have satisfied me more in terms of like what other diagnostics could we have done and we could have we could have biopsied a lymph node um and i think that that is like that is a one open question that i have um i was pushing for actually random skin biopsies to look to see if there was like an intravascular lymphoma but because he was doing he was so well that it didn't it like the essentially the team was like it did it doesn't fit with one of these kind of more progressive monophasic disorders um yeah, and I think in this case, only time will tell, right? I think that's spot on. I, I love that. I think time is going to be your most important diagnostic tool here. And the if he stays out of the hospital, then you've clinched this diagnosis and definitely should, should report it to the world because it's so interesting and so rare. Uh, but that time, being cautious and watching that time, so far two months have passed and he's well, which is consistent with your hypothesis and it adds, I think, you know, additional data to support it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ori. Yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, folks, I, I, you know, my, um, my opinion is um, that I think you, I think um, you have to be careful here for two reasons. I think Reza made a very compelling case for why you want to be careful that you're not missing something sinister. And I think the other reason you have to be careful is because, because you may be onto something really important and you don't wanna miss the opportunity to clarify something that we may have been ignorant of for our entire existence. And you know, I just learned this lesson um, when reading about the history of discovery of a relatively novel syndrome called anti-MDA dermatomyositis, which if you ask folks 10 years ago, um, you would have, perfect. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, no, no worries at all. It's all good. Thank you. Um, if you, um, you can see that that story actually was just delayed by, um, by extreme skepticism as to the existence of this entity. But at the same time, that skepticism is important and healthy so that you don't um, erroneously um, uh, misclassify something. So I think what could this be? We could be we as a group could be wrong about what this is and it may be that we're wrong in, in a couple of ways we're wrong that it, it actually is explained by a diagnosis that we already understand and that our our data collection and our thinking was incorrect or we can go wrong by labeling it um, as a stretch of something we already know like a, a typical manifestation of gout or we could go wrong by recognizing that it may be explained by a disease entity that we don't yet 
understand that hasn't even been named yet. So I think we have to be careful in three ways. One, is this actually a missed uh, staph toxic shock with a unique response to antibiotics? Is this a crazy presentation of gout or is this a syndrome we don't even know and begin to put together? So I really, really um, love um, the notion of let's not, let's recognize that whatever this is, this is unusual and probably doesn't fit very well with confidence or anything we already know. And it's so important to maintain the humility of saying, let's call this whatever um, and main maintain the humility to recognize that we need time for, for the dust to settle on this case. And also, I would also argue for time to let other um, cases like this emerge so that we can understand what the common denominator is. But I can't thank you enough, Ori, for presenting it because the only way that we can understand this is if these cases are described and narrated. And I think the tendency of most of us in cryptic cases where the answer isn't known is to run away from case presentation. It's to say, hey, I don't know the answer, so I'm not gonna present it. Which unfortunately is a, is a behavior phenotype that's encouraged by the current standards to publish a case report, which I think is a shame and even more reason to join VMR and present your cases on VMR. So. What's my biggest takeaway? I'm so grateful you presented it. Um, and my personal takeaway is I'm not gonna tuck it in into any specific Evernote. It's not gonna belong anywhere for me. And I'm gonna create a new a note saying crazy case presented on March 4th, 2022 by Ori Lieberman. And um, I'm, I'd be so curious if I see at the VA, I have a good chance of seeing gout, and pay closer attention to people's vital science and whatnot the next time. Robin, that was beautiful. I'm going to pass the mic to Sam, but I just want to make one other point for all the trainees that are on this call. And I just wanted to highlight Ori's curiosity and questioning. Like, I think if it were anyone, not anyone, but Ori, I don't, but his curiosity is what led to a plausible story that might be rare, but is definitely, I think, the leading hypothesis. And with that curiosity, I feel our patients get the best care possible and we extend our knowledge. So I think, Ori, what you demonstrated is showing that curiosity, asking the why, and then coming up with a, a, a unifying um, story. What an amazing case, like really, truly so unique, uh, fantastic job. Thanks guys. You're not just saying this because his mother's sitting next to him, right? <laughs> I'm waiting for you to step away, Dr. Lieberman, so I can ask Ori why the excisional lymph node biopsy was, I'm just joking. <laughs> it was, it's always the intern's fault, so. Yeah. I'm joking. <laughs> no, no. All right, Sammy, you have the hardest job of all. Is, is, is this case, summarize it and teach us, please. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Ori, for this case that was just mind blowing. I think every single person in this room just had her, his or her mind blown and we all learned so much. So thank you a lot for bringing this case and amazing discussion by RLR. So let's go to the teaching points. Um, when we have pain in only one joint, um, we should first consider periarticular diseases, for example, rotator cuff diseases or tenosynovitis. When more joints are um, affected, the likelihood of an arthropathy increases so that the problem is really the joint. And then we should really think of systemic processes, for example, autoimmune diseases, infections, and also crystalline use can sometimes manifest with polyarticular disease. Um, Reza made the good point of the loose stool and inflammation. Is it, is it a signal or noise? And we should always consider loose stool as a bystander for when there is systemic disease, because when your whole system isn't working well, why should your gut work well? Um, when we see inflammation plus joint disease, we have to think about three main categories, inflammatory, for example, connective tissue diseases, rheumatoid arthritis and spondyloarthropathies, infectious diseases, for example, septic arthritis and gonococcal bacteremia, which is a VMR classic, and also crystal disease, gout, pseudogout, um, yes, when we hear or we see a patient with full body redness, we should immediate, immediately think about erythroderma, which Reza taught us that it's caused through systemic vasodilatation and 
one third is idiopathic, but most common causes are um, psoriasis, but also my myeloproliferative neoplasms, medication, medications, graft versus host disease, T cell lymphomas, especially the Caesarea syndrome, and rarely intravascular lymphomas. Um, then we had the problem that this clinical syndrome always recur recurs um, and then fades away. And then we should always think about exposures, for example, certain drugs that cause hypersensitivity reactions. Alipurinol is the most common cause of drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome, um, which could have also been a possibility here, but also environment, environmental causes like um, <laughs> the stuff with um, the bird expo 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 exposures that Reza taught us. Um, but also hereditary inflammatory disorders, for example, Stills disease, um, familiar and Mediterranean fever, et cetera. Um, then we approached diffuse erythroderma with distributive shock, which immediately made us think of toxic shock syndromes, staph, strep, um, which, cons which demands recurrent um, fast empiric antibiotic therapy, especially with clindamycin, because clindamycin inhibits toxin synthesis from the bacteria and always look for the tampon. Um, when we have the combination of steroids and continuous opioid use, um, we should always think about the renal ins insufficiency because both suppress the HBA axis, also opioids do it. Um, then we had this low, low, low glucose in the septic patient. Um, typically septic patients are more prone to hypoglycemia and when we see hypoglycemia, we should think of adrenal insufficiency, ins insulin deficiency, and also neoplastic effect, for example, the Warburg effect. Um, then we had this diffuse lymphadenopathy, the erythroderma, which made us think of the cutaneous T cell lymphoma. And when it's more generalized, we call it the Cesare syndrome, which has typically clefted nuclei um, of the clefted RBCs on the clefted cells on the um, peripheral blood smear, alopecia, hyperkeratosis, and also diffuse pruritus. Um, then we had this rare constellation of end-stage renal disease plus valvular thickening without an infectious inflammatory cause. And we should always consider um, crystal deposition. And I highly encourage you to listen to the RLR episode, um, which had a similar manifestation. And I think the most important um, message for this session was or is that gout is a systemic disease and is not only limited to the joints. Um, we can have tophi everywhere. This patient had peri esophageal tophi. Um, also think about endocardial deposits and this rare entity which we talked about and is very interesting. Also can manifest with distributive shock with certain flares. So thank you so much. Sammy, I, I was smiling throughout your teaching because you taught more than we actually taught. You added your own teaching points and they were brilliant. I, yeah, thank you for that, Sammy, like truly. I couldn't say more. My job is to thank you all for joining us today. It was an absolute delight. And uh, Ori, um, I'll have, I have um, I can't I will shoot you an email I'd love to uh, if you have that case report I'd love to um, get a hold on it and maybe we can send it out to the uh, VMware will serve but, um, thank you for an incredible incredible Friday bye all <laughs>